Hi, everyone. Welcome to the How to Fish podcast by Taylor Tackle. I'm Ed Hitchcock. I'm your host. I'm also the owner of Taylor Tackle, and we are here to teach you how to fish. And if you already know how to fish, here's some great news. We are going to make you a better angler. So the way that this podcast is designed is that we are going to come out with a multitude of episodes that range from absolute beginner level all the way up to expert level. So each podcast is going to be denoted in the library and it is going to say, hey, this is a beginner episode and we're covering this topic, or it's going to say intermediate covering this topic or expert slash advanced. We're also going to have some awesome guests on here that are experts in their species or area region of the fishing world, and they are going to impart their knowledge on myself as well as all of you listeners out there. We're going to ask them a bunch of questions and get them to give all of us some awesome fishing advice. So that's the podcast and a wrap up. You are going to learn a lot here. This is educational first. I know there's a ton of fishing podcasts out there that are kind of, you know, either super advanced or talking about things that are going on in the industry or, you know, the the tournament scene. Uh, what we want to do here is to give you the information to make you a better angler, whether that's your first time going out or, you know, your 500th trip of the of the last decade, we want to get you better at fishing. So that's what I'm going to do. To help you on your fishing journey, we have a whole library, a free library of ebooks that you can download. If you go onto our website, tailoredtackle.com, and look at the fishing resources section, there's going to be a link to our fishing library. And this has ebooks on how to fish, you know, specific species, different tactics, techniques, places. Um, all of it is free. And for this specific episode, we'll have diagrams and images and instructions for everything that I'm talking about in a graphical format um, that you can review and look at after you're done listening. So go check it out. So for our first episode, my goal is to give you the absolute basics to get you out there and to catch your first fish. So this is a beginner episode and I'm going to cover, you know, how to legally go out and catch some fish, uh, the seasons and species and the licenses you need, where you're going to try to go, the gear you're going to need, the bait you need, some techniques and tactics to actually, you know, catch the fish, um, and proper handling for catch and release. And so all of these topics are very complicated. I could go on for days and days and days about each and every one of these, and we will throughout this podcast to make you better at them. But for now, this very first episode, I'm going to condense everything for just absolute basics and the goal of this one is to get you out on fresh water uh take note of that it's fresh water for this episode um and to catch a fish this is going to be easier species probably around the panfish family so bluegill sunfish perch crappie something in that species um and then we're going to get to the more complicated stuff throughout this podcasting journey through all of our seasons so your first step is to make sure you're doing this legally. Now, if you didn't already know, you need a fishing license to fish. That's in every single state here. And we're starting with freshwater on this episode because there is freshwater access in every single state in the United States, even in Hawaii. Um, and so don't worry about, you know, saltwater just yet. There are definitely ways to beginner fish in saltwater, but let's just focus on freshwater right now. So you need a license. The best way to do that is to Google your state's name and fishing license. And that'll bring you to, you know, your DNR, WDF, whatever they call it. They've got a bunch of different acronyms for it. But the wildlife agency that's in charge of issuing licenses. And one of the nice things that came out of COVID is that you can buy your license online in almost every single state. I don't know of a state that you can't do this in. So every single state you can buy an online license and print a temporary license and you can use that the moment you buy the license so you don't have to go to a store um and so you can buy your license online to go fishing and you can print it out and you can fish that moment um 
And so you need a fishing license to fish. The the states all have their own like kind of like day or week where it's free for everyone. But like the timing of that's absurd, right? Like just buy the license and go out there. If you are a resident of your state, it's typically going to be pretty cheap. It's not going to be some crazy thing. If you don't know if you want to do it or not, you can buy like a day or a three day pass or a seven day pass. But if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably interested in it enough where it would make sense financially to just buy an annual. Um, and they're not going to be that bad um, as a residence. I haven't seen anything um, north of $100. I think that most people's annual fishing licenses as a resident is going to be somewhere between $25 and $75. Now, I don't quote me on that because I, I own licenses in like 15 states. Um, but I haven't purchased one in every single state in the U.S. But just know it, sh- it should be somewhere between 50 to $75 or 25 to $75. Um, if you're a non-resident, <laughs> that, that number is going to go up, especially if you're trying to fish out in the West. Uh, but don't worry about that right now. The second thing is fishing seasons and species. So I'm going to try to make this super easy. Uh, It can get way more complicated if you want it to, especially if you want to start catching some interesting fish and fishing in some interesting places. But for now, just make sure that you are fishing in season. That's typically, if you're in the middle of the summer, you're going to be fine. So it's typically from, you know, the beginning of spring to fall is the general fishing seasons across the U.S. Now, you need, you should know the exact date of the open and the close, and you can Google that. Um, it'll be on your state's website, but just like super easy, it's going to show up, is if you just Google your state and then fishing season, and Google will typically like bring up in a little box pulled from the clip of your, you know, wildlife website, what the dates of the season are. So, I'm sure a lot of you are out there being like, oh, you know, I haven't fished before. Maybe I could just go and do it and I'm just going to cast and nobody's going to give me a ticket or anything because I'm just going once. Like, you would be very surprised. I will not go out with anyone or fish with anyone that doesn't have a license um, because you will get caught. It happens. Like... There are a lot of officers out there and, and I mean like this is just like outside of you know ethics like as a sportsman or woman you should have the ethics to always buy a license but you'd be surprised like I I get stopped at least 10 to 15 times a year for a license check. Now granted I fish more than the average Joe but I would say once or twice a month I get checked. I always have my license. I've never gotten a ticket. But, you know, some states are pretty harsh. You could lose privileges to fish for the rest of the year. They could confiscate all of your gear. And and that's just, I mean, all of us pay for these licenses to rehabilitate the habitats and maintain good stocking. Um, and I could go on about this forever, so we're going to keep going. But just, just know you have to buy a license before you drop a line in the water. You just, you have to do it. Um, there's no negotiating around it and you got to fish during the right season. Now there are species restrictions out there. We're not going to get too deep into this because what I want you to do for your very first day fishing is to just catch and release. I know you might have it in your heart that you just really want to harvest a fish, but that's going to add a bunch of complications right now. And I just want you to focus on catching a fish. I don't want you to focus on processing a fish and, and filleting it and, and making sure that the meat is okay and making sure that the one you took is within the regulations. And it's just adding a lot and you've got a lot of work to do just to get your first fish. So let's focus on just catching a fish and releasing it. And that makes your reading requirements around the rules and regulations a little bit easier because we are going to be going for the smallest species which is typically the easiest to catch. We're going to go for panfish um, in freshwater, which is going to be basically bluegill or sunfish. These smaller species that are about the size of your hand, they typically have very liberal uh, regulations. And if you're catching, releasing them, almost in every single state, you're going to be fine. So like, I think you should still Google and read all of your regs and stuff, but I know that that's not realistic for absolutely everyone out there. So if you're going to go out there, you know you're in your season, you know you've got your license, 
you're going to catch and release. If you're going for bluegill and you're catching and releasing everything, you're going to be fine. Um, so those are the rules. I know that's kind of a crappy thing to go over in the beginning, but like I have to do it. You have to do it. We all have to do it. We have to be on top of it. So that's done. Let's get into the fun stuff. Locations. You have to have a place where you can go and fish. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're an absolute beginner, chances are pretty good you don't have a boat. And I we're not even going to get into the boat thing. Um, we are just looking for a location where you can fish from shore. Now, this is going to be a little tricky because if you've ever been on a lake, you see that a lot of the lake is typically private residences. And so what's really cool is that there's an app out there called Fish Brain, um, F-I-S-H-B-R-A-I-N. Um, you can download it. It's an app. It's free. And it will show you all the lakes in your area and where they have access, public access. Um, and so that's super helpful. So you've got to find a spot where you can legally go out and fish. Um, if that's a little too tech savvy for you, and this is like a little much, you can call your DNR. They're they're super nice. They always are. Your DNR. That, that's an acronym. It, it depends on what state it is, but your wildlife agency, right? And you can call them and you can ask them like, hey, I'm in so-and-so town. Where's the closest place that I could fish from shore? And they will like back of their hand and know exactly where you should go. Um, and so what you're looking for is typically like a boat launch or a park um, or even a lake that's in a state park um, that has public access from shore. And when you're going for these smaller species, it's going to be helpful if you can have a fishing pier or a dock. Now, fish brain's super helpful in finding those because it'll show you um, if there is a pier there to fish off of. Um, and so docks are good for you right now as a shore-based angler because they give you that distance from the shore to the deeper section of the water so you can cover more and not have to cast as far. Um, and it just gives you access to deeper water, which could be essential depending on your body of water. So that's location. We're going to have thousands of podcasts on where to fish and how to catch these fish in specific locations. For this podcast, we're talking about just finding access. Um, so fish brain, find a local spot from shore, whether that's on a park or a pier, preferably a pier uh, that'll give you a dock. Panfish are great and easy off of a pier because they typically congregate around weeds and underneath docks. They love to feed there. Um, and you can typically just throw your line in the water with some bait and you'll probably catch a fish in that location. So going on to gear. Now, again, this is the this is the story of this entire podcast is um, let's not worry about all of the stuff. Let's just focus on the absolute basics. And that's what we're going to do with the gear here. So you need a rod and reel, you need some fishing line, you need a bobber, a weight, a hook, and some bait. So that's the list. Now, <laughs> prices, selection, all of that stuff, let's just make this easier for you guys. Just buy a spinning rod and reel. You can go to Walmart and get an absolutely you know cheapo one if you think you might not be interested in this. Um, it's going to break in a couple weeks, but whatever, you don't care. Um, or you can get the one that we make. It's it's nicer, but it'll last you forever. Um, just a spinning rod and reel. That's a good beginner size is six and a half foot length um, and a 4,000 um 4500 3500 to 4500 size reel um and so that's going to be like any of the traditional combos that they sell in a store something about your height with a reel that you'll you'll kind of know when you see it but the exact sizes would be 3500 to 4500 um then you need some 8 pound monofilament test you need an assortment of sinkers uh like split shot, split weight sinkers. Um, you need some hooks. You need a couple of those like small clip on bobbers. They're red and white. Um, if you're worried about all of this, like tackle, we make like a super cheap, easy beginner basic tackle kit that has all of the hooks, weights, um, and bobbers that you would need. 
uh, for literally it's an, it's enough for your, the rest of your life, honestly. Um, but it's only like 15 bucks and it gives you all of the sizes and then eight pound monofilament test. I think I already said that, um, that we make too, but you can buy anybody's just eight pound, uh, mono, and then you need some bait. For fresh water, there are bait restrictions in a bunch of different states, but the one thing that they all have in common is pretty much all of them, like 99% of the water bodies that you're going to have access to are going to allow live worms. So worms are fine. Buy some worms or night crawlers. Buy them at any of the local sporting goods stores. You can buy them at Walmart. You can buy them at a little tackle shop. Um, if you don't have access to those, you can always just dig them up in your backyard look under rocks, look under leaves, look under stumps and branches. If all of that isn't available, like let's say, and this is a situation that I was in, I lived in New York City <laughs> and I couldn't buy worms anywhere and I couldn't find worms anywhere in my apartment building, right? Um, there is a website called Speedy Worms. We use them for ice fishing because uh, we buy bulk wax worms from them and they sell night crawlers definitely affordable. Uh, you got to buy them a little bit in bulk, but like, it's not something crazy. It'll be like 20, 25 bucks. Um, and you can buy them from them. And so that is the setup, right? That's all you need right now. And it's going to get way more complicated when you want to get better and you want to catch a bunch of species, but this will catch any fish in freshwater. It's not the most optimal setup for largemouth bass. It's not the perfect setup for pike. Um, it's not the greatest setup for walleye, which is one of the most challenging species. But you know what? Everything in freshwater will bite on a worm. Um, I shouldn't say everything, but you know, you sticklers out there, you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. All of the common species that you would be fishing for are going to bite on a worm. So that's all you need to just absolutely get started. Rod and reel, line, bobber, sinker, hook, worm. Um, and so now we've got the location, we've got the gear, you've got your license, you're ready to get out there and go and catch some fish. So let's kind of walk you through how I would go about catching a fish in that you know local public access spot um, and how to catch this panfish. Now, right before I get into that, I want you guys to remember to go to our fishing resources library on the tailoredtackle.com website. So if you go in there and you download the how to fish ebook, it's going to show you all of this stuff that I'm talking about um, in images and graphics and things like that. So when I'm talking about tying your line or spooling up your reel or whatever, um, it's just too complicated for me to explain right here. It'll take up the entire podcast. So just go onto there and download that book so you can read through everything and see what it actually looks like in person. Okay, so you read the book. You didn't, but like, let's say you did. Um, and you've spooled up your rod and reel and you're at the dock and you're ready to go fishing and you got to put your rig together. How I would set up your rig for this specific scenario, you're catching panfish with, with worms is you're going to tie a hook on and I would tie on a bait holder hook. It's the one with the little barbs on the back of the, um, on the back of the hook. And I would tie that with a clinch knot, which has a diagram in our ebook on how to do that. I would take my little split shot weight and I would put that about a foot above the hook and I would pinch that down onto my line. Now, another foot or two above that, probably more like two feet, I would clip on my snap bobber, which is going to have two sides to it. It's going to have like a little hook on the bottom and a hook on the top. The hook on the bottom, uh, on the red side, I do first. And then the little button on top, that should be on the top of it. That's where I'd clip on the line. So it goes on the outside, but it's clipped onto the bottom and onto the top. There's a diagram in the book. Look at the book. Um, anyways, that's your rig. You can adjust your depth by moving the clip bobber up taller or shorter, but the, 
the thing you're going to have here is that you can't cast very far if it's more than, you know, two to three feet up from that weight because all of a sudden your rig is, is giant. So you're trying to fish for these fish in three to five feet of water. And so the clip bobber, the easy bobber, um, and your bait is totally doable and, and that's the depth, right? So, so your, your bait's going to sit, your hook with the bait on it is going to sit, you know, maybe three feet, three to four feet below your bobber. Um, and, and that'll be manageable to cast. Um, but I don't even really want you to cast right now. Um, you're going to be on a dock, preferably, right? And you've got your rig set up. You're going to bait your hook by taking a piece of night crawler. I don't want you to use the whole night crawler. It's too much for these smaller fish. You're taking one of the smaller bait holder hooks and you're going to put on a pinch of worm. So if that is like a regular worm, just like a small one, um, I would cut that in half by just pinching it between your thumb and your forefinger and then just using that half of a worm. If you're using a night crawler, I would just pinch off um, about a half inch to a quarter inch piece, small piece, and I would just pinch that off of the night crawler and bait it on your hook. The best way to bait it, again, got a diagram um, in the book, but you're going to slide one end up onto the barbs on the back of the hook, and then the other end you're going to just pierce through the um, point of the hook so it's kind of like skewered on there. I know it sounds gross, but these are some things you're going to have to get over if you want to start catching fish. So you've got your bait on your hook underneath your weight. That's underneath your bobber. Um, and all I want you to do is go over to the edge of the dock and set it down. It sounds crazy, but most panfish species love to congregate around a dock. Um, and they love to feed right next to it. It provides them shade and cover against predators. It is a easy place for spiders and critters and even those people that are feeding ducks or whatever, garbage, things like that that fall off the dock. They love that. Um, so it's just a great spot for them to be at. So why cast if you've got this amazing cover feature right underneath your feet? Um, and you can just drop your bait down and see, typically you'll see a bunch of panfish just come running up and screaming up and hitting your bait. Um, now, if you don't have access to a dock, you can fish from shore and you are going to have to learn how to cast. Um, and so if you're on a shoreline, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find that part in the water, that kind of like area in the water that drops off deeper than three feet, but not more than six or seven feet. And that's typically like about 10 to 15 yards away from the shoreline. Now I'm talking in general terms, every lake is different, but you should be able to see um, where it would kind of become chest high. And that's typically where the weed line will start. And so you want to cast your bait out and around the weed line. You don't want to go into the weeds because you're going to get stuck on the weeds. But panfish love to be right around the weeds and they, they use the weeds as kind of like a home base, like a cover area where they can ambush prey, which is, you know, whatever it is, small plankton, bugs that fall in the water, whatever. Um, and so you're going to want to cast right on the inside or right on the outside, which is typically a weed line is going to be um, adjacent to the shoreline, meaning that it's running along in parallel with the shoreline. So you either want to cast over the weed line and try to reel your fish back over the top of it, or you're going to want to cast right before the weed line. Um, and so in either situation, you will have some fish come and take your bait, right? Let's, let's hope it happens. Um, and so when that happens, your bobber will be submerged. Your bobber serves as two purposes. It serves as a bite indicator, which will show you when a fish is on, but it's also important because it serves as a depth parameter, meaning that it keeps your bait elevated in the water above the bottom. And this is why we were talking about setting at a certain amount of feet in accordance to how deep you're fishing is that you don't want your bait sitting on the bottom for most species. Most species feed 
upwards. Um, and so you would want to present it to them about a foot off of the bottom. And, you know, it could be really anywhere in the water column, especially for panfish. But the big key here is that you want your bait floating somewhere between a foot to three feet off of the bottom where it's not getting hung up on the bottom itself or in the weeds. So that's what your bobber's doing. It's keeping it up in a float so it's not just, you know, sitting on the bottom getting all stuck on logs and whatever. Um, so your bobber's out there. It's holding your bait up, whether that's right next to the dock or right next to the weeds. And when you start to get a bite, you will see your bobber move. You'll see movement. You want to keep your line open and allow that bobber to move around a little bit. If you have a bigger sunfish on, that bobber will submerge. After one to two seconds, maybe three seconds, um, and I would typically count to three of your bobber being submerged, tighten up your line till it's taut, and then just give it a little tiny, like, pull not not a huge pull but this is this is called a hook set where you're just going to do a little little tug once the line is taut to set the hook in that fish's mouth um and with panfish they're so small so this needs to be super light you could even not set the hook and you're probably you're probably going to hook them but really light you basically move your rod tip an inch or two um, to set it and then you gradually reel in the fish we're not going to worry about drag or fighting fish or any of the big stuff because these fish are going to be small and all you're going to have to do is reel them in. Now, when you are reeling in a fish after you've made your hook set, you want to gradually reel them in so that the line stays taut. You don't want any slack in your line and you want to reel them up consistently. Okay. Let's say that the bobber doesn't submerge fully because these fish are smaller. So what could happen is that the bobber just goes left and right because they're too small to pull the bobber all the way down. If they're going left to right, if your bobber's moving around and what it'll do is it'll do this like tap, 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 move, 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 drift left, drift right, tap, 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 tap. Um, if that's happening, count to five seconds and then reel it in because what's likely happened most of the time is that the fish did take it, the hook is set, and it's just too small of a fish to take the bobber all the way down with it. Um, but you know, you do want to be careful because you could miss a fish this way if it's less than five seconds, meaning they just bit it. They tried to run off with it and the hook didn't set on its own. Um, you'll lose the fish. So try to give it about five seconds if the bobber is not fully submerged, but you are seeing bobber activity, um, to set the hook. All right. So you set the hook. You kept your line taut, you gradually reeled in. Do the one 1,000, two 1,000, and that one 1,000, two 1,000 is a full circle, um, a full rotation of your reel handle. You wanna do it nice and slow because if you set the hook really hard and then you reel really, really fast, um, that's gonna do a lot of pressure on the fish. It's gonna damage the fish. And your goal right now is to catch and release successfully you don't you don't want to have a dead fish on your hands right now because you don't you don't want to clean it i just trust me you don't want to go through that whole process on your first day um so just be careful and that kind of goes into the releasing portion that we're going to talk about where okay you've got the fish you've brought it in now you've got to get the hook out of it and get it back into the water um and so a couple ancillary things that could be very helpful, especially as a beginner, is to have some like workman's gloves or even like they, they sell gloves for fish removal, just whatever, just workman's gloves or whatever glove you can kind of put on. And then a pliers, a pair of pliers. We, we have them in our uh, freshwater fishing kit, but if you just have some needle nose pliers, th those will work too. Now, this will allow you to release the fish in a healthy and consistent um, and convenient way. You don't absolutely need them because if you take the fish up out of the water, you cup its belly in your opposite hand, right? And then you gently wrap your hand around it to make sure that your hand isn't on top of it because they have sharp spikes on top of it. So the belly of the fish, you're cradling it, you have a firm but gentle 
grip around it, and then you can typically just pop the hook out by pinching your index finger to your thumb around the little circle, it's called an eyelet, of the hook that you tied your line onto. You can twist and pop the hook out with your thumb and index finger. Now, it's gonna kinda sound complicated. It's really not. There's diagrams in our ebook, again, on how to do this, but you know, it, it, it will be easier, especially if you're a little squeamish, to remove the hook with pliers and have some gloves just in case you might get poked. Um, but at the end of the day, right, like it's not impossible. I, I don't use a pliers most of the time unless it's a very toothy fish because um, because you shouldn't be leaving your bait in the water for so long and your bobber submerged for so long that the fish swallows the hook, right? Um, but if it does... We have instructions in our ebook about how to remove that hook. Um, we're going to do a whole podcast on catching and releasing fish and the appropriate ways to do it. It will take me an hour to tell you exactly how to do all of this perfectly. Don't worry about it too much right now. Just make sure that you get that hook out of the fish. And if it does swallow it completely, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, I know but cut the line and let him have that hook. It will disintegrate hopefully over time. Um, it has a better chance of survival if it's completely swallowed the hook. You'll see a little section in, its, in the back of its throat um, that's closed off. If the hook isn't visible at all and he swallowed it, he or she has swallowed it, it has a higher chance of survival if you let him swallow it and pass the hook and it'll rust out and it'll disintegrate and go away. Now, it doesn't mean the fish is going to survive. It, it could easily die, but it's got a much higher chance of dying if you try to perform surgery on it and rip that hook out from inside of its stomach. It's just not going to survive that. So if it absolutely swallows it, cut the line. Um, and this is kind of why we're starting you on species that are easier um, in terms of removal and, and catching and things like that is because these species typically have a really healthy and sustainable population in your body of water. And so if we have that accident where, you know, the catch and release isn't successful, it's not the end of the world. We're not trying to do it, but it's much better than you, you know, practicing catch and release on an overslot walleye and losing that fish, right? Um, which might sound like gibberish to you right now, but as you become a better sportsman, sportswoman, um, you'll see the value of catching and releasing appropriately and making sure that the health of the fish comes first and foremost. Um, now to release it, release it physically, release it out, um, especially if you keep it out of the water, when you're when you're pulling it up of the, up out of the water, do your absolute best to not drop it on the ground. So when they go and they get into contact with dirt or the dock or things like that, that fall is pretty big for them, right? You might not realize it, but you know, two to three feet for them is ten feet for us. So if you just go and drop them from your waist height, that's really damaging on the fish. Also, getting sand in their gills or sand in between their scales is really not healthy for the fish. So do your absolute best to go straight from the water to hands, right? And removing the hook and then bringing it back into the water. Now, another great benefit with the sunfish is that they're pretty resilient. So if you mess up, you mess up. Um, they're probably going to make it. And if you abs accidentally drop them back in the water, they're probably going to make it. But I want you to start practicing what we call a healthy release. Um, and a healthy release is still holding that fish after you've removed the hook, fully submerging it in the water in your hand, and then gradually opening your hand while it kicks to let it swim off on its own. Now, there's a bunch of science and reason behind doing this, but for our sake right now, conceptualizing it, when you fully submerge a fish back in and let it kick off on its own, it gives it the time to recover from the shock of getting caught. So a lot of the times the fish will get stunned 
from either being out of water too long or just the whole act of catching it. Um, and that could cause it to get pretty wonky. And if it starts floating around because you just dropped it back in after it was stunned, one of its gills is out of the water and it's not getting enough oxygen and it's not, you know, acclimating well. And a lot of times fish will die just because they were shocked and then they were floating on top of the water and they weren't getting enough oxygen and they didn't have a healthy release. So it's really good to practice fully submerging your hand in the water and letting it letting it kick off on its own. If it's not kicking off on its own, you can work its tail back and forth. It'll start to kind of give it a little bit of muscle memory that'll work the fish back into realizing, hey, I'm okay, I'm awake, I'm going to get going. Um, and if all of that fails and the fish does die on you, um, you should do your best to harvest it. I know that's counter... <laughs> That's counter to what I've been talking about, but we don't want to just be leaving dead fish all over the place. Um, and if you notice that your releases aren't very good, um, if you're fishing in season and you're fishing for panfish and you've got a handful of them, you know, two or three, it's very likely that they are in season. I'm like 99% confident in your area. They, they might not be, so you, you need to be reading your rules and regs. But if you're worried about it, you know, you can call your wildlife department and tell them what happened and and they can tell you how to get rid of them most of the time you're if you're fishing on public you're going to be able to talk to a bunch of other people and there's plenty of anglers that would love to just take a couple pan fish and fly them so go and look at people on the dock and say hey do you do you guys want this fish it didn't make it if um all else fails i would recommend taking that fish home with you um as long as it's in the slot side as long as it's you know, legal to take it with you. Um, and then you can download um, any of our books, uh, the How to Fish Freshwater one. Um, that one has full instructions on how to fillet the fish. And then you're in a situation where, okay, you got your kitchen, you have your knife, you have uh, a way to dispose of the guts and stuff. Um, and you can learn how to fillet a fish on your own time that evening. Um and if you mess up, you mess up. Uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but yeah, so sorry to go on that long tangent about the releasing of the fish. But as you grow in your fishing career, you will become a better sportsman, sportswoman. And the ethics behind harvesting will become important to you. And I want to get you started off on the right foot to understand how important it is to me and the rest of the community that you're harvesting appropriately and you're not just killing off fish, um, even if it's accidental. And I know it's going to be accidental. It's going to happen. It's happened to me where a release didn't work out. Um, and it's best practice to harvest that fish and pay homage to its life. Um Nobody that's fishing around you wants to see a bunch of dead fish floating around. Um, if it is illegal, if you were trying your best to fish for panfish and the world went over its head and for some reason you got a giant walleye on that was not in the right slot and you caught it and now you're trying to release it and it died, just contact your wildlife agent. Um, just Google the phone number for whatever wildlife agency is in your area and call them and let them know what happened. They're going to be totally understanding. Just explain that you're a first time angler. You made a mistake. This fish didn't release and you don't know what to do next. Um, and they'll take it from there. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm super excited about this podcast. I think it's going to be great. Um, I'm just excited to teach everybody all of the things that I know. And if you are an advanced angler and you've been listening to this the whole time and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is all stuff I already know, don't worry because we are going to be coming out with various episodes about, you know, advanced fishing and expert fishing and and this length, this this long content form length that I'm going to dive really deep into how to target a specific species, even how to use a specific rig for that specific species. Um, and so, and then if you're a beginner, we're going to have tons more of these, um, walking you through exactly how I would do it and imparting all of my wisdom on you. And what's going to be really cool about this podcast ecosystem that we're creating is that you are going to be able to level up with us. And what I mean by that is my goal is to get a bunch of beginners on here that have no idea how to fish 
listen to these podcasts from the very beginning, and then they get to grow into the advanced and expert episodes, right? Where, you know, your skills are going to improve over time. You're not only going to go from this episode of just catching a fish, but you're going to get to the point where, you know, you're mountain fish on the wall because we've got you up into our 400 of expert level largemouth bass fishing and we're putting 10 pounders on your wall and getting you in record books and so that's my goal here i know it sounds vain but that's really the purpose of this is to get you guys either from a beginner to an expert or from that expert to unlimited growth potential in the sport of fishing so thank you so much for listening this is ed hitchcock tight lines <laughs>